Today we're in for a treat. Um, Dan Scheinman is um, may, developed a career over time that spanned um, the practice of law, the um, uh, practice of law within inside of corporation, the development of one of the country's most significant um, technology companies, Cisco Systems, and um, then gone on to do a number of other things, including um, uh, playing a role with the San, San Francisco Giants and becoming an investor in the um, Silicon Valley. I just think we're in for a real treat. We're going to spend some time just chatting with one another and um, provide some opportunity for you all to talk as well. Um, join me in welcoming Dan Scheinman. Good to see you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, David. So I understand you're an angel. Uh, yes. <laughs> In a figure of speaking, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Was, you're, you're pretty cherubic, so I was yeah. just... Uh, Usually I'm a devel because of my Duke connections, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but in terms of my job role, I'm an angel. Yeah, so, so um, can you describe to us a little bit what that means, sort of what's the definition of an angel, and why do you characterize yourself as that? All right. Um, first of all, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to come talk to such an incredible audience about what's going on. Um, my path as an angel is really, I view myself as someone who not only provides capital, but helps provide advice. I, I, in my time at Cisco, having seen a company grow from 40 million to 40 billion, uh, I generally think I've seen every business problem arise at some time or another. And what I want to do is help friends and people in my network realize their dreams, both through writing a check and through helping them solve problems so that they can have the joy of scaling great companies. So how's this week been for you? This has been a great week. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, my first investment, Tango, uh, some of you may have heard, just took an investment from Alibaba. Anyone here have Tango? Do you know what we're talking about? A few hands. Thank you very yep. much. Yep. Check is in the mail. OK. <laughs> uh, so what, what, what is Tango? And uh, yeah. Tango is a uh, mobile communication service. And we started as, uh, in video communication, but now we're doing uh, messaging and profiles, photos, games, everything. So we're really a full mobile communication service. And uh, we, are, we announced that we're 200 million users uh, and had doubled over the last year, which is fantastic. And we also announced a, a $280 million investment led by Alibaba into the company. What's Alibaba? Alibaba is, is everything, effectively. <laughs> uh, they are Google, they are Amazon, they are a bit of LinkedIn and everything of, of China. Of China. Uh, they are a fantastic company, an incredible business model, and they are the leading Chinese internet company, and they're about to uh, go public in New York shortly. And uh, in, in, as many of you know in the messaging space, uh, WhatsApp got acquired by Facebook uh, for $19 billion and a tear in my eye about that. Uh, I wish that had been Tango for 20, but okay. Uh, but they got acquired for $19 billion, and so the messaging space has been on fire these last several weeks uh, as people are thinking strategically about so, their so, so, so let's get, get into the WhatsApp thing um, to talk about Tango a little bit. So you got a, a real, relatively small company that's not really generating any revenue to speak of. Yeah, or, uh, some or massive revenue. Re yeah. Notable revenue, let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah that um, is purchased for $19 billion, which is actually um, a price that is greater than the value of companies like American Airlines or the Car Carlyle Group or Kroger, right? And so it, how does that happen? <laughs> uh, and, and as many of you know, the famous story was that he's a Russian immigrant to the US and he went to sign the deal at the, uh, uh, the unemployment office or the welfare office where his family had to go. So it's quite an incredible story, maybe the single most incredible story of, of wealth creation in a short period of time in America. It also says that I think any of you, if this guy can do it, certainly any of you who have the benefit of a Michigan education should have a much easier road to it. Um, but uh, it says one of two things. It either says, ouch, we're in a bubble and it's time to sell and right. sell everything. Um, or it says, there's a huge opportunity here for building massive audiences and messaging. And it didn't get to that price without there being an underbidder or maybe two underbidders. And therefore, other people are going to need this technology. So it's a good time to be an owner of messaging companies. <laughs> OK, wait, so, so underbidders, do you have the notion of, you know, an underbidder can't be me or, or maybe even you. I mean, this is big, these are big entities. 
Well, it could be me or you, but I don't think anyone would take either of us seriously. <laughs> we bid 15 billion for WhatsApp. Yeah. No, it was uh, Google for sure was in. Yeah. Uh, and there may have been one more that also was in. So, yeah. so there were bidders that, were, that saw value in WhatsApp. Okay, how many of you um, saw that? How many of you used Snapchat? Wow. How, how, many of you, how many of you think they should have taken the $3 billion deal? Not so sure. What, what, what do you think? I mean, how's this WhatsApp sort of deal? Right. So, uh, so when they first announced that, that uh, you know, Snapchat had rejected the deal, again, there were two thoughts in my mind. Again, I was happy to be holding Tango shares because I thought, okay, right, the space is interesting, right? Uh, and then a part of me did say, you know, what have these guys been drinking, right? $4 billion for 20 people. Sounds okay to me, right? <laughs> How much money do you need? But then when the WhatsApp deal was announced, I kind of saw their point. Right, which is if all, you know, they clearly are uh, a very important service, and if you're valued at 40 or $50 a user, four billion from Google sounds sort of miserly for them. Um, <laughs> this, so. is, this is the weird sort of uh, warped uh, sense of reality, right? I mean, yeah. this is crazy, right? Absolutely, it's yeah. totally crazy. So, so let's go back to the original um, sort of comment that you made. Are, are we sitting on a bubble? Yes, um, and so the question, so, um, uh, I told Dave this in the beginning that we should always beware of middle-aged white guys who show up in a blazer, although I took my blazer off. I advise him <laughs> to take his blazer off. Yeah. Um, but one of the things, the good things of being a middle-aged white guy is that I lived through the first bubble in, in 2000, right? And there were a lot of indicia of a bubble. One is that companies start trading at crazy forward multiples. And if you look at some of the IPOs, you're going to see companies trading at 20, 30, 40 times sales, right? Which is high. Um, and that signals that we're, that at least in technology, in new issue technology, there is a bit of a market bubble. Unlike in 2000, it's not dragging everything else up. So the companies that are laggards are still laggards. There's plenty in the economy that's not in a bubble. So I think the, the rest of the economy will be fine. But it's clear that we are overheating in the world of technology. And for someone like me, what that means, well, for, for me what it means is I need to sell. I need to have more good days. Uh, this year while the market is hot. Otherwise, I have to be prepared to ride out the cycle, right? Um, I think for you guys, it means something different. And it means that you have to be prepared to look at your lives on the risk curve, right? And we're clearly moving to a point where things are frothy. And deciding whether or not you're going to take risk and how much risk you're going to take now uh, is really an issue because whatever you do has to survive the inevitable. Um, ending of the bubble that's going to happen. Anyone out here want to start their own company? So a portion I'm actually surprised it's so low. We want to see all hands on that. <laughs> so, so, I mean, what's your advice to those that want to start companies? Um, what should they be thinking about now? And, and you yeah. know, is this something they should start sooner rather than later? Or? So my whole life I've been around this. I started out, as, as David, you mentioned, as a lawyer, um, documenting people starting companies and, and later gravitated towards buying, investing, right, and ultimately now helping start companies. And what I believe personally is that there's a set of skills you need in order to be successful. The role of CEO in these companies ultimately is the chief problem solver. And you need to get as much experience as you can prior to starting to be able to solve the problems of the people who are working for you, right? Whether it be it, they need capital, they need customers, they need issues solved, <coughs> excuse me, um, so you, you, you have to grow to being the chief problem solver. And as you hit this part of the curve in bubbles, what happens is in the press and you know, on campus, you're gonna hear people say, why do you need to go to some crappy company and learn anything? You can start your own company and learn there, right? And the truth is you can, but the problem is, is that if money starts to dry up, again, the level of risk that's taken is you get end up here when the music stops. And that's not fun, right? And so. The biggest thing to think about is where can you acquire the skills you need to acquire in order to be the best CEO you can be and create the most value for your employees and shareholders. So, so are you saying in order to be a, a good and successful entrepreneur, you need to be targeting being a CEO? I, I believe that there's different roles for different people. You don't have to be a CEO. You can be a technical founder. You can be a salesperson. Plenty of roles in companies that can provide really good opportunity. But if you want to be a CEO, you should prepare to be a CEO. And you should think and put yourself in the shoes of the CEO and figure out, it's not just about building product, 
Um, rarely today is it about building product. It's about other things. It's about access to capital. It's about finding customers. And ultimately, it's about having the right product market fit. So right? let's, let's talk about access to capital. When the music stops, so what, what you're saying there is that when the capital flows stop, right? Yes. So, so when the bubble bursts now, over 10 years ago, the, the, first, the first or second time, depending on how you look at it, um, uh, there was just a stop and flow of capital, right? So, so as students are thinking about what's taking place in the, the Valley, I mean, what we're hearing is Twitter, Valuation, you know, they, they did an IPO and the valuation went up. And I heard about that. Were, yeah, and then and we're, we're hearing about um, uh, the pass on Snapchat and all of these things. So it sounds like just the perfect time to be there. And so, how do, I mean, how do you really make that evaluation? And, and should you make it just against capital, right? Right, and I think capital is, an import, is one of the most important things. Capital is scarce, capital is rare, capital is expensive. You have to give up equity for capital, right? Uh, and what distinguishes between successful and unsuccessful companies frequently is access to capital. Uh, so the ability to access capital is critical. And what we know from the last time is that not only did it dry up, but that the people who were doling out the capital got shot, right? So there used to be, in a lot of these venture capital firms, a networking partner who would do networking deals, right? And that, in 98, 99, 2000, that person was the most important partner. Everybody was, was kissing their rear end. They were treated like the king. In 2002, they were fired. So if you were a networking company, not only you didn't have anybody to pitch to inside the venture funds. And so all those companies that had built plans to build yada yada optical networking, yada yada gigabit networking stuff, right? Had no, not only did they have no ability to get access to capital, they had nobody to call inside the venture fund, right? And today's world is a little bit scarier. In, in, um, in 2000, there were about 1,000 venture firms of which maybe 500 were active, right? Today, there's 500 venture firms of which maybe 100 are active. And, and so the industry is consolidated dramatically, right. correct? And of the 100 that are active, five generate the profits for the entire industry. Now, that's going to change a little bit over the last year because some other firms are going to do well because they've had a big IPO. But over the last 10 years, venture has been a very tricky to, business to be in, and it has not been a favorite of endowments and other people. So raising venture money is really hard. And the other bit of craziness we've had is as venture capital is shrinking and consolidating, the number of businesses is going through the roof. So right? we have more entrepreneurs. We have more entrepreneurs. We're in startup palooza. Right. And um, I, you know, I was at Sequoia, which is one of the most famous venture funds. And, I, and they gave me their numbers, which is they, their investment professionals do on average one deal per year. And, and their investment professionals see on average 10 deals per day. So if you think about it, what the job of a venture capital at Sequoia is to say no 2,000 times. At least. At least, right? right? I assume 200 working days, they don't yeah, work yeah, that yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, but, but that they're saying no 2,000 times, right. right? And it shows the scarcity of capital and the hard, how hard it is to raise capital. And when you're an angel and you're going before those guys, right, and you're putting your money in earlier, the job has to be to find companies that's going to somehow get through that screen and make it to the one or two companies that, that one investment professional may consider. Okay, so how, how, do you, how, do you make, how do you make that risk calculation? Okay. So I would divide the world of angels into two general buckets. Good looking and not. No. Um, <laughs> funny and not. No. Yeah, right. um, uh, humble and not. Yeah. No. So uh, no, I think that it... it, it uh, it really falls into two buckets. There's one who are in the group called Spray and Pray. And they believe, yep, they don't know. And, and they don't know, that, in fact, Ron, Ron Conway is the most famous angel investor on the planet. He's a Spray and Pray guy. They don't know what's going to work. They don't really care. If you pass some diligence screen, do a little bit into everybody. Just a little bit of capital all over the place. All over the place. Yeah. And, and, and your it, winners cover your losers. It's a statistical play, right? It's I mean, sort right. of a statistical play. And, and with some degree of luck, yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll bungle on big winners. That's what the incubators like Y Combinator have done. Right? Y Combinator says it's created 20 billion of value. Uh, I think two companies account for 18 billion of that value. Okay? Um, so, hey, that's though, pretty good, right? Um, I tend to be more, um, I, I want to be strategic and I want to be in places where I can add value and where I trust the team. 
And so I say, let me work with people who I trust and who I like, and where I can find a 10 to 1 kind of potential return, where I see the, you know, that it's disruptive and revolutionary, and where's that, where there's that opportunity to really uh, create significant value, and particularly in places where the market isn't going. Because the truth is, if I have to compete with uh, Sequoia, right, and it's me and it's Sequoia, of course the entrepreneur should pick Sequoia. Really? Of course. No, there's no question because yeah. Sequoia has billions of capital under management and can provide for them you know, unlimited capital, right? So they don't have to worry about where their next round is coming from, right? Um, now, I think there are reasons that you, you, would, you might choose me because I'm going to give him a better price. Yeah, so the, the and, share and of advice, equity but, or... But you're taking risk right. because I don't have yet unlimited capital. Yeah. Um, unless some of you want to spend $17 billion to buy Tango or other companies, uh, <laughs> then it may be a different situation. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, those kinds of guys, uh, if you try and compete with them, it's really hard. And the truth is, is that they are increasingly doing what we would call pattern recognition. And what they're looking for is product managers out of Facebook or Google or LinkedIn. And they try and find those people and put them into, you know, their next venture. They're right. not just finding these products managers through Facebook. They're going to the company themselves and yes. finding employees of. Or, yes. yes. And, right. and saying, you know, hey, tell me when you're interested. Let's get to know you. And the VCs themselves are hiring people out of those companies who know the good ones from the bad ones to go and find them and fund them. So the chances, so, so if I was to try and do that, I'm competing against the largest, most sophisticated venture operations in the world. And most likely, quite frankly, I will fail. And so my story was I needed to find a different way to look at the problem in order to be relevant. And what I saw was that there was a bias in Silicon Valley and, and, and quite frankly, I think um, uh, an opportunity uh, because people look at age in a strange way. And people think that at the age of 35, you no longer pass the ramen noodle test, which is we live on ramen noodles, <laughs> work your rear end off to try and make money. Anyone here live off of ramen noodles? <laughs> yes, I see has some hands there, yes. We can fund you. Um, <laughs> Come now, up afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Call Mark Andreessen immediately. Uh, but the reality is that, um, you know, they, that, that people were not willing to fund entrepreneurs over 35, right? The CEO of People Tank, meaning VCs in the Valley. VCs in yeah. the Valley, right? And frequently the irony was they were all over 35. So I was hearing these people who were sort of like, sadly, like me, middle-aged white guys, telling another middle-aged white guy, you know, we don't like people who are a certain age because they don't work hard. What about you? You know, they don't, they, they're, they're not very smart. What about you, right? And it, it's sort of an odd thing. And so it left open a gap in the market where I found that older entrepreneurs who were equally passionate and quite frankly, smarter sometimes because they knew more, they'd been burned. They'd had, failure is the greatest teacher alive and they knew failure, right? And you know, uh, you have to do your diligence and you have to make sure you find the right people. But the reality was is that there was a market abnormality where I could get better pricing, better deals, better quality deals by sticking with that market. Where are these deals coming from? Are, you, are, are they come beating a path to your door? Are you having to go to certain places? I mean, right. So let me say this, that particularly now in, in this whole entrepreneur or, or uh, you know, startup palooza that's going on, good deals are rare, right? And there are only so many good deals. And the num you know, if you look at the number of companies that are valued at a billion dollars, it's a very small number of companies over all the many thousands that have been started and funded. Right? So it is rare to find good and great deals. And to find them you know, is lucky. You have to, for me, I, I'm a believer that the whole thing comes down to the people. And so I value referrals from my network dramatically. I value you know, um, people who I know who've worked with them who say, I swear by this person. Um, I value diligence, which is controversial. There's some, people, some funds no longer do personal diligence anymore. What do you mean by personal diligence? Um, David, let me call some references about you. How, let's see your work style. How, what do you do? So, How so do you it's do not, it? It's not just about the numbers of the company. It's right. about me. It's about you, because yeah. we're going to make a bet on you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that I am, one of the, the hidden secrets of Silicon Valley VCs is, David, we're happy to fund you. We're so glad you're part of the family. Let's find a replacement for him, <laughs> right? Uh, and so frequently behind the curtain, they're already planning the exit of the entrepreneurs. Uh, now, some firms are different. Uh, Andreessen is famously different. He's very pro-entrepreneur, as, as he has been one. And uh, 
and he is not one of these you know, plotters of replacement and, CEOs. And by pro-entrepreneur, you mean, okay, you started the company, you're going to keep on with the company, either running it or playing a, a critical role. Yeah. Right? We'll give you yeah. first chance yeah. to, to run it. Yeah. Um, and I personally, though, I am pro-entrepreneur. I don't want to find a CEO. I don't like that process. And I think that you really want the people who care most about it, who, who eat, sleep, drink the technology to, to run it as best they can. And so for me, I want, I, so, so that says I, we're getting married and I've got to know a lot about you. Yeah. And, and the crazy thing is when you get married, sometimes you take the risk. But in this case, I'm wise and I don't want to take the risk. I want to know. Mm -hmm. And so I want to spend a lot of time calling. And I always tell the story, when, when I was, I joined Cisco at age 29 and I was a nobody, okay? And within the first few months, I get a call from John Doerr of Kleiner Perkins, right? Dan, it's John. <laughs> As if we had known each other our whole lives. <laughs> yes, Mr. Doerr. John. Yes, John. Yes. Uh, you know, please call me John. Okay, Mr. Doerr. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he said to me, I'm looking for a reference check on Jeff. Can you tell me what are Jeff's strengths and weaknesses? What does he do well? Do you envision him being the head of marketing at this particular company. And I was so stunned that John Doerr, number one, found me, took the time to call me and listened. That I always said, if I'm gonna be in that position, I'm gonna take the time to do the same bloody thing, right? Yeah. And I'm gonna reference check religiously, I'm gonna learn who these people are, and, you know, and I'm gonna know what's going on. And I, I, you know, the, uh, my first investment was Tango. And it came referred to me by my cousin, who uh, was a consumer guy and had just come, uh, just come out of, uh, you know, uh, Bebo, which was his, which was a, he was the first employee of Bebo, uh, which went very well. And he said, look, I found these guys. And so I said, okay, let me let's start doing diligence. Let me just check. Let me go meet them, blah, blah, blah. And I did a number of things. It turned out I knew the lawyers for them. And I asked, I knew his last venture capitalist and the place he failed. So I talked to the VC. And I began to get a remarkably rich picture of him, right? Uh, and then I said, okay, I'm gonna send my good friend, uh, Charlie Giancarlo, who happened to be at Silver Lake, which is a PE fund, over to meet him. And he was- you know what PE is? Uh, private equity. Private equity. Late stage. Yeah. And so he said, I'm an investor in Skype, and Skype should buy these guys. I said, okay, excellent. I ran over with a check. I said, enough diligence. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the true story is Skype did come in and make an offer, and only because of what I would describe as insanity, uh, they, they ended up backing out of their offer, which is a huge mistake. Skype would have been even more valuable had it bought Tango. So, okay, so this whole, this whole idea of, um, you know, becoming a uh, in incredibly, a adding value in the marketplace. Yes. Um, there's a number of different sort of factors in that space. I mean, certainly one of them for the sustainability of a company is revenue. Yes. Okay, we're, we're selling a product, we're selling widget X, and we're getting enough revenue back to run our company and, and scale it. Um, but, but that's not what's happening in some of the technologies that we're seeing, like the Instagrams and the WhatsApp. Um, here we're, we're talking about something different. They're waiting, they're waiting, if you will, for the monetization value um, proposition. So can you just, is that a good thing? Is that? Yeah. How so, should we think about that? So let me give you, at that very high level, there's a split between consumer businesses and enterprise, businesses that sell to other businesses, right? In consumer land, right now, we are in a radical phase where people are saying, we don't give a darn about revenue, we care about growth, and we assume that if you're the number one guy in this space, you're gonna figure out revenue later. So the market is screaming, grow, 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 and don't worry about revenue, right? And you can see some of that a little bit, like you know, Amazon has never actually made a profit and the market doesn't care. It just says, keep growing, right? Facebook, I don't know that Facebook ever needed to make any money. It just had to keep growing for a certain period of time. Now it's at the point where, where it has to make money. Um, but we are at a point where you know, growth in and of itself on the consumer side is really important. Now on the enterprise side, that's not necessarily true. You still want to make money because you know, businesses want to know that you're sustaining. They're not going to invest in something, plug it into their system and then find out, oh, there's no business model, now we've got to rip it out, and worse, our customers are dependent on this. So there, it's, it's different. But let me just step back again and say, I, we talked about this for a little bit, but I just want to say, the joy and the whole process of startups, right, it has to be, it's around making those kinds of decisions. And it's about understanding your product market fit and when to grow and when to actually sh shift, go to revenue and 
how to deal with reaching those customers. How do you find your customers and how do you grow, right? It, it's about making sure you have enough capital to realize your dreams, right? And being able to, to find those dreams. And then it's about making darn sure you delight your customers. That your customers care about your product and are delighted by it. So, so how, how has Tango, for example, found its customers? So Tango um, gambled and in the very beginning. So in the very beginning, we had a problem. We had two problems. One was we had FaceTime, was advertising like crazy, and Apple at the time owned probably 70% of the market for, for smartphones. This seemed to be a problem for us. They had yes. launched FaceTime and we were going with a video calling service. And the second problem we had was Skype was launching mobile stuff. Although the problem with Skype's mobile solution was it, 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 if you left it on, it drained your battery. Right. So, not, you, not so not people frequently send an email saying, do you want to Skype on your mobile mm. phone? No, let me get to a PC or yeah. whatever. Uh, so it had very low, low usage, and it also didn't work on Android for a long time, and it may, still doesn't work on some variants of Android. So we came into this and we said, we have to go big or go home. And so we decided to call Walt Mossberg, who at the time was the tech reviewer of the Wall Street Journal, and say, we have to show you this, we can make video calling work anywhere. And don't ask me why he did this, but Walt Mossberg decided he was going to run the test on BART, going through the transbay tube. Okay. <laughs> So Tango, of course, was paranoid, right? How much bandwidth is there on BART on the Transbay tube? Right. So it actually shut off the service, except for him, to try and make the bloody thing actually make sure it worked, right? And there were, at the time, there were you know, 40 or 50 people on it. It wasn't like it was a massive service at the time. It worked well enough that he gave it a good review, right? And, and so when he gave that review on that day, uh, 10,000 people a day started showing up. So it started in 2009. This is... This was in 2010. 10, so a year later. A year later, um, we launched and we had, we had literally 10,000 people a day start showing up and the number's only gone up from there. Okay, so was the product solidified as is at that point or were you getting feedback along the way and you're starting to pivot and, and adjust? For the first 30 days, you could neither share video nor do calls on it, okay? So it, 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 we had, it didn't work. <laughs> it, it had minor problems, it didn't scale. Right? So as long as you, you know, since its only service at the time was video calling, you could do anything with it except video call. Right? You could look at your contact list. <laughs> I don't know how interesting that was. But they gambled. <laughs> and what, in software, what happens, particularly consumer software, you can fix anything. Right? And so the view was, okay, we, now we know we have demand. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. And we fixed fast, and we iterated quickly. We got the thing to work. And then we were blessed by the fact that Android took off. And FaceTime doesn't work on Android. Right. So all of a sudden, now we had this market all to ourselves, right? And Skype didn't work on much, right? And, and one of my favorite stories is that when Microsoft bought Skype, um, uh, for whatever reason, it, ne it never worked on Windows Mobile. So anybody, the four people who had Windows Mobile, who all work, I think, in Redmond, all were <laughs> using Tango to do video calling because right. they couldn't use Skype. So at one point, they finally, after, this is in 2012, they finally got out. Uh, the version of Skype on Windows Mobile, and they put up a sign in headquarters, Skype for Windows Mobile now available. Please stop using Tango. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, okay, like, okay. Hey, we've won. Yeah, uh, this is um, good. It's cool. So, so yes, yeah, so, so relentless focus on, on who we were and our differentiation. Now, the other thing that happened, quite frankly, was the other mistake we made was early on we said, you know, should we go, should we be a messaging company, should we be a video calling company, should we be something else? And it turned out we chose the wrong market to some extent, right? Because although we were king of video calling, turns out WhatsApp was growing like a weed, in fact, faster than us, right? And Snapchat with photos yeah. was growing like a weed faster than us. And so we had to really adjust. We were going to be king of a market that we were worried wasn't going to be that relevant. So we quickly realized, hey, there was an opportunity to become a full-on platform in the space and that we had the best opportunity to do it. So, so by full-on platform, all of these things are integrated into one thing. And, and we have a business model with gaming where we do social gaming and, uh, you know, and so it helps us pay the bills, keep the lights on, and gives us the ability to, to scale. Anyone here do mobile gaming? Hello. Wow, actually that surprises me. And this is, this is really the, the growing space, right? I mean, yeah, well, the fact these guys are studying all the time. That's great. <laughs> Michigan's doing a good job. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, uh, mobile gaming is popular and growing. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was coming here, I was shocked by the number of mobile gamers I actually saw 
um, you know, going through the airports. It ha I mean, certainly it's, 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 the penetration of it is done very well. And gaming, by the way, by the way, is a really crappy business because it's a hits-driven business and there's just a small number of hits at the top of the pyramid. Right. So if you're gonna, if you, if you're gonna build games, you gotta be successful, right? That's a truly go big or go home business. Yeah, so, so um, Tango just did this, um, you know, received this infusion of cash basically from Alibaba. Yes. What's it gonna do with it? Um, I think one of the things that, well, first of all, uh, the co-founder Eric Sutton, who's active on Twitter, announced that uh, we're gonna double the company in terms of headcount. So you're gonna hire? We're gonna hire. Yeah. And one of the things that I believe, one of the big ideas I've always believed in is that in, in consumer land, the worlds of communication, commerce, and entertainment are gonna merge, right? Today, you have separate platforms. You go on to uh, Amazon to buy, at least in the US, not true in China, but you go, you go to Amazon to buy things, right? You may communicate via one of these services, WhatsApp or, or Snapchat or Tango or whatever, right? And you are entertained somewhere else, right? And you may go to YouTube or you may go to, to Netflix. Right? But the reality is that these services are all gonna to come together and the monetization of them are gonna to be tied together and that they're gonna be more integrated than people realize. And what Alibaba, who is one of the smartest and best run companies in the world recognized was that it's in their interest to have a communications player in the family and their dream is to be able to integrate everything in a way that helps drive their core business and creates new opportunities. So give us a picture into what that integration might look like. So there's something I can talk about. You, one of the things you saw is the deal that Alibaba did before us was they bought 40% of a Chinese content uh, thing. So imagine a world where they bought some soccer rights and now they can show the soccer game and have people communicating, right? Or buying t-shirts, right? Uh, our, our, the guy who was before us was probably in his Pakistan shirt because today was a big cr uh, test match or cricket match, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, you know, imagine that now you could sell those to the people watching games as they, you know, uh, as it goes on. Or that you can, you know, talk to your brother who's in a different city and, and still watch the video going on, right? That, that these worlds are gonna collide and they're gonna create incredible opportunity. And Alibaba is becoming both a content shop, it's the leading commerce player in China, right? I, I, I believe that a lot of uh, Chinese cities may never need retail in the same way that, that the, you know, older cities have because they're gonna have these services done electronically, right? And uh, so it, it, Alibaba has this now, it's got, it's got content, it has uh, commerce, and now it's gonna have communication and it's gonna be one of the first companies to really attack the new world. So a lot of your investments um, in the angel space are around big data, cloud computing, uh, cybersecurity, et cetera. They all kind of integrate, right? In so, some sense. Yeah. So, so my thematic, and again, this is another thing to look at, I think for you guys to think about, right, as you look at your careers. But my thematic is, the numbers say that most angel investments, it's seven years to monetization. That means whatever you do has to survive seven years. And if you're investing in things that are today's activity, right, investing in a messaging company today might be a mistake, or a social company might be a mistake, because those markets seem to have happened, right? Um, but you have to invest in something that's gonna be strong enough to be around seven years from now, and someone's gonna to have to want seven years from now, right? And that problem is significant, right? And for entrepreneurs, it means you've gotta stick with something for seven years, right? right? And you've gotta believe in it for seven years in spite of all other innovation that's going on, right? And for founders, it means you have to think, choose big themes that, that present big enough markets that you, if you hit, there's enough opportunity there that you can survive the ups and the downs that occur in whatever's going on in the market, right? And for me, it also has to be something where it's disruptive and where the big guys are not necessarily looking at the same types of opportunity. So, so it'd be easy to be sitting here as a student and saying, okay, cool that you're doing that. I actually think it's really interesting, but how in the world did, what were some of the decision-making paths that led you to that? Um, what could you say to students, um, some, some learning points in your early career decision-making process that might be valuable to them as they think through? Right. Of... I, I'm gonna tell you two things that really s stick with me in life, right? And one of the things I think that will happen to a lot of you guys is you're gonna hear about people who get great jobs at great companies and have a great boss and free food and blah, 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 right? 
The best thing that ever happened to me was I actually had one of the world's worst bosses, whose name, I kid you not, was Savage. I worked for a Savage. <laughs> And rarely was there truth in advertising so clear, okay? <laughs> um, and I learned everything I learned from having the world's worst boss. I learned how not to do, how not to approach management, right? Um, but it also was great for me for a number of reasons. First, I realized I was not going to be a partner in a law firm. I had to think about what else I was gonna go do. And second, I had to mentally prepare myself for how I was gonna go do that, right? I had to imagine myself sitting in the chair opposite, right? And, you know, I think in this room, obviously it's an entrepreneur class, so I hope that many of you are gonna to want to go be entrepreneurs, right, in one role or another. And I think that your early career should prepare you for how to go do that, right? And again, I'm not sure, some of you are gonna be blessed in that you can walk out of here and be an entrepreneur tomorrow and you've got the whole package. But for a lot of you, you have to figure out where you're gonna learn and how long you're gonna learn before you make that leap, right? And in the crazy world of today, right, the, the, the dominant path, right, there is, mercifully, I still have a lot of the older folks to myself, which is good, um, but, but the dominant path is that you have to be an entrepreneur before you're 35, right? And the question is, how much risk do you take, how much experiences do you have in order to be ready? And there'll never be a day, it's not like, you know, you're gonna get a phone call, uh, hello, this is God, you are now ready, please go be an entrepreneur, right? That <laughs> phone call doesn't happen, right? Um, so you're gonna have to self-assess, right? And what I would say is you have to have experiences, both good and bad, to understand yourself, so that you can decide, okay, I got this, or I don't have this, I need to learn more. And I, I once delivered this pitch to a group of young engineers who took it too literally, so please don't take this too literally, but your career is like a bank. Right? And what, you're gonna, what you wanna go do is deposit skills. And you wanna have short learning periods, short intense learning skill periods where you learn. And the hope is by some age you've learned enough to say I got this and at least I know more than the people I'm managing. Right? And I can help solve some of the problems, I got great instincts and I'll figure it out. I'll build a network of advisors to help where my, my stuff runs out and I'm gonna be fine. But you have to know yourself well enough to know when you get to that point. Right? And, and we just said, the second thing was, oddly, if I started with my worst boss, is I immediately went to one of the greatest bosses I ever had. And that person knew me better than I knew myself and was focused on me. She never actually cared about herself or her job, uh, optically, I mean, I'm sure she did, but she really focused her energies on me. And she wanted to make me the best I could possibly be. And she told me one thing, she said, look, I want you to pretend like you're in your next job always, because then people will treat you like that and you'll move up the scale, right? And she, she constantly said, you know, every two years you switch jobs, that's it. You do not stay any longer than two years. And I think today one might say one year, right? Yeah. Um, but you, you have short, short, intense cycles of doing something right. and then you move. And if you don't move, you got a problem. There's something wrong, right? right? And right. so, you know. Excellent. Well, so I wanna give a few minutes for um, some of you to ask some questions. Let's have the lights come up and uh, give you an opportunity to ask Dan some questions. I'll tell you one quick story while, while, while mics are getting ready, which is um, I found myself one, one time recently, a company called Sentinel Labs, we were, we were in competition with traditional venture, first time, um, you know, uh, where we were in that situation where it's a security company, and I've never seen anything like it, right? Everybody all of a sudden was opening the doors saying, we're in, right? And the entrepreneur chose me. And he said, I trust you, and I think you're always gonna take care of me, and I'm gonna go with you, and I think I can raise another round, right? And we're, which, which actually, we're, we're, right now, we're in the process of doing, and it's, we're gonna do it. Um, and what I found was so refreshing was that the entrepreneur realized he needed help. And what he said is, I want you there, because you, I know, are gonna care about me. Right. You're not gonna care about you, where some of these funds, they care about what their return is, and what their LPs think, and all this crap. I want you to care about me. And this is, this is uh, to go back to this sort of bifurcation of uh, uh, types of angels, this is the difference between the re sort of yeah. retail and, and, and really investing alongside the CEOs. One question here. Okay. Thank you for the question, by the way. Check is in the mail again. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier that part of the business for Tango is mobile gaming. 
Do you see um, free to play as what will be the continued payment method going forward, or how do you think that will change? I, so I think both there will be free to play and there will be paid games. Right, both will exist. Right, the predominant. So it, the reality is that the user pays either way because free to play just means you're paying in game. Yeah. Right. So. It just is a matter of some franchises are so strong that they can actually charge a little bit and then lessen the in-game payments, where other franchises that you really, you know, you're not going to get any users unless you start free to play, right? So I think both business models will exist. For a company like Tango, because they can handle mobile distribution, right? When you have 200 million users, all of a sudden, what, what Tango started with some mid-tier games that all of a sudden were zooming up the App Store, right? Because people started playing them on, Tango doesn't care either way because it can handle mobile distribution, which is, which is fantastic, right? And, and its bet is that mobile distribution becomes an important wheel in the whole thing, and the fact that it can be cross-platform is going to be really important. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. All right, guys, University of Michigan, would you please help me thank Dan Scheiman? I'd like to encourage any of you that wants to talk to Dan for a few minutes. He'll be down here, uh, down front. Thanks. Thank you.